How are you doing, Gabe? I'm doing well, Greg. How are you? I'm doing well. We switched sides this week. We did. You're mixing everything up. <laughs> um, so last conversation we had was about Neumann and the general, uh, w if we're using the, the setup from Redeeming Vision, this idea of developing our archives, we were thinking about how the more broadly you read and the more you understand general, uh, you could call them, well, the Jungians call them archetypes, Yeah. how it provides like a larger pool or a larger archive that you can draw from. Um, and so we discussed the kind of, specifically this like dualism that he, that Neumann in particular highlights, the fact that every symbol has some degree of a light side and a dark side and, and how that can help us start to understand just meaning in general. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of meaning beyond, I mean, that's what the Jungians would put yeah. forward is that it's not just understanding art. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so since then, I had you read this book here. What is, what is this? Yeah, so this book here is uh, The Language of Creation by Matthew Pigot. Um, and it's about, well, it's, it's still about symbols and symbolic interpretation, but it's, it's instead of kind of looking at it from this really broad perspective or from the idea of the Great Mother, like Neumann did, uh, he goes through the book in a, a kind of an analytical reading of Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, goes through the the kind of Abrahamic creation story and a lot of the symbolisms and uh, you could say poetry and stories and mythology of that time yep. and, and breaks stuff down using kind of this really systematic symbolic approach. Yeah, one of the major, um, I, I think it's a major misuse of symbolic interpretation often comes from uh, I think a misunderstanding of Jung and how he uses symbols and to talk about the archetype. And this is this idea that basically it's like a language you have to learn. Mm -hmm. Once you learn the code, suddenly you can see how hidden throughout everything are these little coded messages that you can interpret. And then it's like, then you know the true meaning of something. Yeah, yeah. And in this book in particular, it's... Um... Well, there's this this kind of repeating image that he draws out a bunch of times. It's this, uh, you can think of it as if like lines connecting the points of a triangle sort of thing. Yeah. It's kind of this split, a line coming down with two lines coming off of it. Mm -hmm. And that that kind of idea as um, fitting things into that shape. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the, you'd call it maybe the cipher to the code is the idea of this, yeah. this idea. Right, right. That's what... Um, Matthew Peugeot and his brother Jonathan, who is Matthew's like, well, he wrote the book. He's very analytical. He's like a computer programmer who's like living in a yurt in the middle of the woods somewhere in Canada. Yeah. And his brother is a icon carver who mm -hmm. has risen to some degree of notoriety because of his friendship with Jordan Peterson. And Jonathan is far more of the like public figure who's going to conferences, who's on YouTube everywhere, but they're developing similar ideas together. Yeah. Um, so I like to, I just think of this as like the Peugeot's ideas. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I've really taken to, and I think can be really helpful, is they're not necessarily saying, oh, here's a raven. This is what a raven symbolizes. Mm -hmm. Rather, they're trying to take a step further back and not look at individual symbols, but think about human meaning making and the way in which it relates. One of the things that Jonathan frequently says is he talks about, you have to remember that you're an embodied person. Hmm. And, and so their structure, their language of creation is not so much to say there are things in the world that have specific meanings, but rather to say that there is a structure to the way we interpret the world. And if you understand that structure, you can start to see why the raven has a particular set of symbols associated with it. Mm -hmm. And then you can see, well, actually, look, it's subtly different in these different cultures, which Jung was doing that. That's what I mean by it's more like a misreading of Jung. Yeah. To say that, oh, once I, once I look up the Wikipedia entry as to what ravens symbolize, I'll always understand every representation of a raven. Yeah, yeah. I think when we talk about it like a language, I mean, one of the, one of the helpful ways to think about it is like spoken language and... Um, understanding the the definition of a word can only get you so far. 
Right. Like right. just knowing what the word raven means. You know, yeah. raven is a bird. Raven is a black thing with feathers. Raven flies. Yeah. Raven does all these things. Right. Um, but that's really only scratching the surface because if one of us were to say raven, you know, maybe all of a sudden we're thinking about Edgar Allan Poe or we're thinking about graveyards or right. it's October right now. Maybe we're thinking about Halloween and mm -hmm. kind of that sort of symbolism. So. Which, which again goes back to what I love about Wendell Berry's initial essay that we started with, this series of reminders and that there are, there's a huge nexus of ways in which certain images can remind you of things. Mm -hmm. If you know Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The yeah. Raven, then when you see an image of a raven, you might be reminded of that poem. Yeah. If you don't know the poem, you can't be reminded of the poem. Yeah. Because it doesn't come to mind. Um, and that's where I think this uh, Jung is actually really good at that. When you read his book on dream interpretations, he's like, he never says that like an owl always symbolizes wisdom. Yeah. It's always in the context of a therapeutic dialogue trying to understand what is your relationship to an owl? Mm -hmm. It definitely has an archetypal kind of association and it frequently can hold that for many people, but it's not necessarily that for everyone. You know, if you're a child and for some reason you were attacked by a great horned owl when you were four years old and you barely remember it, an owl arriving in your nightmares will mean something very different yeah. than someone who, you know, grew up with totemic images of owls and and talking about the wisdom of the ancients or the elders in mm -hmm. the context of the owl. You know, yeah. it'll be two very different experiences, but they're still getting at this fundamental thing that Neumann sets out with the dualism of, you know, the great mother being both the terrible mother and the loving mother. Mm -hmm. um, but then Jonathan and Matthew, uh, I think it's pronounced technically Matthew. Um, Matthew. I'm not, I'm not good at my French, so I apologize if they're listening. Um, they get at something like getting back to the, the, what they're trying to do with the language of creation is put us back in this mindset of an experience that is embodied. We think about so many things um, through uh, like our cognitive side of our mind mm -hmm. instead of our creative side of our mind. And so we frequently have forgotten a lot of things. Even, and you see this all the time in our language. You know, people will say things like, my brain has an imbalance. Yeah. It's not me. It's like literally a mind-body separation. Mm -hmm. And that is not necessarily healthy, first of all. But it's also not a necessary separation. There's, there's a way in which you can bring them together. And a lot of the ancient thinkers were doing this in, of, of all religions. Yeah. Like almost every religion is some form of trying to handle the mind-body relationship, mm -hmm. and what does that mean for our anthropology, and what does that mean in the context of our cosmology, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you you mentioned this weird, he, he has all these very esoteric <laughs> diagrams. Yes. Um, lots of people have complimented them. I think they're incredibly confusing. Yeah. And, and but you know, some people. There, um, it makes sense when you when you said that he was a computer programmer. It makes so much sense because they're they're somehow they're right in between like the most esoteric like alchemic symbols and like those PowerPoint arrows. Like that's a, precisely where they fall. Is like the computer made this and it is trying to communicate information that is so hard to understand. Yeah. Well, and you can see okay the language of creation rather mm -hmm. than something <clears throat> like symbolism. Uh, or like the symbols of creation. Yeah. It's like he is coming at it from a particular mindset of realizing that it's like if you program in different functions in a computer, you get specific output outputs based on what those are. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's, again, going back to. There's a structure of reality. Mm -hmm. And whether, whether you think that's objective or not, whether you think that's divine or random chance, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. What matters is we as conscious beings experience a very simple dichotomy yeah. in the world, and it's and it's caught up in Genesis yeah. when it says God created heaven and earth. Yeah. What was your interpretation? Like, what does he mean when he says what What does what do the Pajos point out the difference between heaven and earth? Yeah. So going going back just one one step real quick is what he's essentially setting up here is first of all tying things back to the dualism idea immediately. Um, like it's this idea of separation. It's this idea of um, pointing things apart art because of their differences, categorizing, and um, more so his actually his entire way of viewing the creation story of Genesis 
is this series of branches. Like everything is separated and then separated again, kind of constantly being refined. Yeah. Um, yeah, they like to use the word fractal. Fractal, yeah. A yeah. repeating pattern that changes scale at every degree of like, um, of differentiation from the original. Yeah, yeah. And um, well, to, to kind of jump into that specific example immediately, like the thing that they're pointing out is, well, right away, you have this, this kind of the most important and the most kind of uh, essential difference to understand about creation is that there are these two sides of things. There's this physical kind of reality world, this material world, and then there's something else. Um, yeah. It talks a lot about wind, motion without movement, talks about all of these kind of very, he goes at it in a lot of roundabout ways, but essentially what he's getting at is the difference between the spiritual and the physical. Right. And that's what, a, to, wind is a great example because, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you think about the Bible, the Bible is like, um, you know, if, we've, if we think about all of the way in which we create meaning as attaching to a network of meaning, then you'll see, like we've discussed before, that there will be like huge foundational areas where almost everything is connected to this one thing. Yeah. And regardless of what you think about the Bible, the Bible is like foundational and connected to almost everything. Yeah. It's like the first book that took all of the oral histories, all of the different cosmologies and theologies and religious ideas and judicial ideas, mm -hmm. and it started to codify them in a series of stories. Yeah. And so, you know, um, Eliad, um, Marcel, Marceau, Marceau Eliad, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. It's French again. Um, Eliad works a lot, and as do uh, people who generally fall under this category, they're called syncretists, who are trying to demonstrate all the commonalities between cultures and religions, and, and in an interesting way, and Jung kind of works off of that a bit. Um, but at the core, what they're trying to do is, uh, it, it's like the Bible brought together all of these ideas that worked well enough that people remembered them. Yeah. And you could argue that's divine and inspiration, or it's just, you know, I don't know, we got really lucky. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, uh, it's interesting because we already talked about Jordan Peterson once, but one of one of my favorite quotes by him, I think he opens up some some lecture I saw by him with it once, is he, he, he kind of gives this defense for why he spends so much time on the Bible. And obviously mm -hmm. me and you are both Christians, so we spend a fair amount of time reading the Bible anyways. Yeah. But what he essentially says is, regardless of whether or not you believe that this is divine or a holy scripture or just, just a very strange book, as somebody who's living in Western society, you need to understand that the Bible is what it's all based on. Like, right. That's right. like, that's, it might not be true, you know, the further you get away from America or the UK or Europe or whatever, mm -hmm. but at least in kind of this, this circle where we're here on a, American college campus, you know, speaking yeah. English, like the Bible is really where all of this kind of basis from. Right. So. Well, and, and then you're highlighting a great uh, contrast, and that is the fact that the Bible is not the foundational text for, say, Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, instead, you have a lot of Buddhist texts, mm -hmm. a lot of Hindu ideas. And one of the things about, well, we're both coming from Western culture. Yeah. We know it well, so this is where we find our comfortability. Yeah. But what it also does is when you understand this, then when you start to research something like, the Bhagavad Gita or, or something like that. It's yeah. like, then you can start to see the contrasts and the similarities. Yeah. Because you've dug deep into, this, into the ideas behind one system, you're able to see where there's conjunctions, which then relate, like really confirms a lot of the work that Neumann, the Peugeots, Eliad yeah. is doing is showing that there's something about human existence that seems relatively constant. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is very exciting this, like what you said, kind of the substantiation and the idea, mm -hmm. which again, if you think back to like that School of Athens painting, it's like Plato's pointing up, yeah. Aristotle's got his hand down, down here. Yeah. And in like those two different philosophies, it's kind of like one or the other. It's all about heaven, it's all about earth. Yeah. And what Peugeot is saying is like, no, it's this. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like, it's both yeah. heaven and earth, Yep. which gets to what, um, we talked about with Geit, yep. literally talking, and Shakespeare, like the poet looks from heaven to earth and earth to heaven mm -hmm. and makes that which is, he, 
he bodies forth that which is invisible. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you can start seeing, like, back to the wind thing, invisible movement. Mm -hmm. It's like you can feel it, but you can't see it. And we constantly forget about this because we think we understand wind. We have a scientific, we've we've defined the idea of wind. Mm -hmm. So whenever you feel wind, you don't think, what was that? Yeah. Like, it's the wind. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I don't, like, what would you even call wind? Like, how would you define the word wind? Yeah, yeah. It's like such a, I mean, it is something that's so commonplace and at the same time so, like, incredibly strange where it's like, oh, no, all of a sudden, you know, everything around me is just going to get pushed this direction and I'm just going to be okay with that, I guess. Like, that's just no apparent reason. It's just all moving now. Right, right. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, so scientifically, it's, you know, um, extremely small particles that make up our atmosphere changing based on temperature yep, and, and pressure temperature and currents yep. and pressure and so like because I have some explanation for that it doesn't spook me whenever the wind comes yeah but I don't think about that embodied experience especially it's easiest if you think like get rid of a scientific notion for a moment and the wind hits you it's like what do you think it is mm-hmm. where did it come from yeah that's a strange experience mm-hmm. but this gets at like i i love this kind of uh project that they undertake i don't know like i i don't have any way of fact checking and saying peugeot's um like like the peugeot brothers claim that they are trying to re uh rekindle an ancient um like psychology almost, Mm. an ancient notion of consciousness that merges mind and body a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. And so you can see there's been like, like someone like, um, uh, oh, why can't I, uh, Verveke, um, Jonathan Verveke, um, Jonathan Verveke, is that his first name? Um, Anyways, he's he's a a great Zen Buddhist thinker, Mm. loves Plato and Socrates, and he resonates a ton with Peugeot. It's yeah. like, again, you can see the similarities of this project of merging together these two things that most of enlightenment thinking have separated out. Yeah. And we've, we've said, like, you've got your reason, and then you've got those, like, animal-based instincts mm. that really you should ignore. Yeah. It's like, but so much of our experience is actually both of them, which to me, as an artist, I hear that, and I'm like, this is what we've been missing in the dialogue. There's so much of, like, imagine... If art was just about the cognitive, you know, you could call it heavenly realm. Yeah. You wouldn't actually need to look at the art to understand it. Yeah. You actually just need to understand the ideas it represents. Yeah. We talked about that uh, in an earlier conversation where there was this idea of, it was back when we were talking a lot more about nexus points and about art being like a focusing point. And it was kind of this question of, you know, do you really need the art? If the, all the art is, is this nexus point, could you just sit and, you know, you're, um, your, your cement room, could you wall yourself away and, and kind of reach these same conclusions that, um, that maybe art would bring you to or this map of nexus points could. Mm-hmm. And our conclusion after you know, a couple conversations is no, there's something very important about, again, this physical, like, right. which, which is very strange to think about because we talk about something you know, like a, um, uh, we'll go back to, to Rembrandt's painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Mm-hmm. Um, where what we were actually looking at material wise was you know old oil pigments and canvas and and the way that light is bouncing off of things and all these things but somehow through those physical things you know through the color red which was made with you know egg yolk and all these weird materials all of a sudden we're able to have a better understanding of what it means to be forgiven it's Mm -hmm. like well all of a sudden we have this really weird back and forth movement yeah. happening again. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I want to more clearly define what the Peugeot has put forward. Yeah. In heaven and earth, they separate this out similarly, like idea and physical, but not only that, he says seed and like manifestation. Yeah. And like what, how, what was your understanding of the seed metaphor? Yeah, that one, um, I'm not going to lie, that one was definitely confusing for me. There was a lot where I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I'm getting, but um, getting from this, because he was, he was talking a lot about the, the separation between plant and seed. That was something that he yeah. kind of started to, to right. almost hyper fixate on, was that there's an important difference on there, in, in the same way that he was fixating on things like um, 
birds and fish being different. We were like, yeah. oh yes, obviously, you know, birds and fish are, are different in some way. But then I, I couldn't quite get that part. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you got how, like, he's, he's going through the first few chapters of Genesis, the creation yeah. thing, and you keep getting these weird pairings of things. Mm-hmm. Heaven, earth, light, dark, sun, moon, water, land. Yeah. You know, plants, or uh, uh, animals, fish. Yep. Seed-bearing trees, and then it's like a creepy crawlers. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's all of these dual th- things keep coming in pairs. Yeah. And it's really mysterious if you don't understand the framework of what heaven and earth means. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to that seed thing. Yeah. Um, if you think about it like category, so category tree, mm-hmm. and then oak, elm, aspen. Yep. You know, like you're getting all of these specific things. Yeah. The category, the idea realm, is broad and unchanging. And the and and uh, so it's like a constant almost. And the but in the the material realm, everything is different. So the best thing I'd like to think about is like an acorn. There's some variation in each acorn, right? Mm-hmm. But they're generally exactly the same, especially yes. if you're looking at like a white oak. Yep. Every single white oak acorn is generally exactly the same, mm-hmm. so much so that the imperial system is based off of that. Like when they talk about shoe sizes yeah. in, in the imperial system, uh-huh. it's talking about the average width of a barley corn. Yeah. So if you're an 11, your foot is 11 barley corns. Mm-hmm. It's like the seeds are that similar yeah. that you can set up a standardized measuring system off of them. Mm-hmm. So the acorn is unique. Uh, or it, is, it lacks a uniqueness. It has a generality. Mm-hmm. But every oak tree, even every white oak tree, completely different. The branches grow in a different way. It's like idea, when it's seeded into the soil of material, interacts with so many different things that its manifestation is necessarily different every time. Okay, so yes. So in that sense, what it's, it's setting up is like the realm of, of constant and fixed versus the realm of variable. And that's heaven and earth, seed and manifestation. I see. And as you start going through those substantiations, what the creation story is showing is it's, it's similar to, um, have you ever heard of Ian McGilchrist's uh, mas- The Master and His Emissary? I've heard of it, yeah, yeah. And so it's exploring, you know, why do we have a hemispherical brain? Yeah. And it's like you have an ordered, structured version, our rational side, Mm -hmm. and then you have this exploratory, intuitive version, which is far more of our creative side. Yeah. And you you can also see why things like, you know, this manifests itself in the yin and the yang of like something that goes out into the unknown and some part of you that handles the known. So there's this bifurcation of the things that are stable Mm -hmm. and constant and then there's a part of you that needs to interact with the thing that changes. Yeah. And Peugeot's showing that from the very beginning, if you understand that, so you're like, oh, heaven and earth have to be created. Realm of category and realm of material substantiation that allows for variety. Then it's like earth or, or light and darkness. Light's kind of like all the same. Yeah. Every shadow changes. So, so to make sure that I'm understanding you here, just to, so what we're talking about is, this is actually links really closely back to that idea, idea of, um, well, maybe I could say, maybe I could say, it's like giving a specific, uh, giving like a specific point on that map, right? So if we have this nexus and all of these different kind of nodes or places where things are interacting, it's easy to say like, okay, around here is where trees are, but do you really, um, Use drawing as an example. It's easy to look at a tree and say that you've seen a tree, but in order to like really understand a tree, you have to like like really look at it. If you want to draw a tree, you need to be able to look at it and really understand how it moves, all these different things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what we're kind of talking about here is this idea of where it's like, I have an idea of the tree in my head, but that tree also doesn't have any specifics to it. I don't know where the branches are. I don't know how the leaves are shaped. I don't know yeah. why it is the way it is. And, but something about taking that idea and bringing it down into the physical world or bringing it down into the soil all of a sudden gives it this specificity and a more kind of important and unique understanding. It's not even like it gives it specificity. It necessarily manifests itself in a specific way. That's the difference between the two. Okay. When we just say tree, all of the ideas of trees in our mind are general. 
There's okay. not a specific, like literally, there's no specificity. Yeah, yeah. It's not until you start materializing that. You know, like even if you think about really, really good prose, mm -hmm. a nice story, we often say, it painted a picture in my mind. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is, it substantiated this idea. Yeah. It started to give me a sense of the particularities and that made it <clears throat> unique. When you say like, there was a man, it's like, okay, that could be anything. It's like, well, there was Gabe sitting in a green shirt on a rainy day yeah. in Campus Ministries of Hope. It's like, oh, you're starting to paint a picture and necessarily what it's doing is it's taking it from heavenly seed mm -hmm. of man down to, well, what man? Yeah. And you can see this, so like every level is doing that. The best, the most, the easiest one is um, earth and water. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's, I wanna talk about uh, the heavens and the earth. Yeah. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so what can you see if you think about the embodied experience of understanding the world, just like, you know, imagine you're the first human being, you are waking up and you notice like, there's some change up there. Yeah. When we think of heaven, I don't, I don't think we think of it being very constant. Yeah. I mean, it's like literally the sun rises and sets every day. Mm -hmm. The moon rises and sets at weird times. Yeah. And it changes size. Yeah. Like it goes from circle to not circle and, and back. Mm -hmm. And then the stars subtly shift and yeah. human beings are noticing this. Yeah. But if you, and we think, well, the earth is stable. You wake up in the same place where you went to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. But think about like a, well, wind is a great example, but think about plants growing. Like every moment of waking up on the earth, there's all kinds of things that change. That's mm -hmm. why we're in a new location today. The yeah. earth changed. Yeah. And on, so it's like every single manifestation on the earth is different. It's the same thing like every day is a new day. Mm -hmm. You go outside, you need to check the weather. You, yeah. need, you see all of these things and there's way more variety closer to the ground than there is up above. And they even, this is why this, like just that idea alone explains how to understand medieval models of the cosmos, where it's like, oh, you have the fixed stars and the wandering stars. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so you can see, like if you look up at the sky, there are some stars that wander. We call them planets, yeah. Mars, Venus. Yeah. These are the ones that they started naming the, the zodiac and different, different degrees after. Mm -hmm because they changed more, mm -hmm. which meant they were closer to us. Yeah. So the most fixed heaven <clears throat> is that most distant one, and it's typified in the Northern Hemisphere by the Northern Star, because yeah. it basically doesn't change. And so you can see them saying, that's the farthest one away, mm -hmm. because what is the highest level is the most fixed. Yeah. And as you come down, you're getting more and more change, which is why the moon is closer than the sun, because yeah. the moon changes every month, whereas the sun, kind of changes over the course of 365 days. Yeah. Um, so you can see these different degrees of like, when God creates the heaven and the earth, he's creating a stable thing, and then a, a, a varietous substantiation. Yeah. Then it's like earth and water. It's like the earth, when you, so again, if you compare earth to water, the earth's way more stable. Yeah. So now it's taken on the role of that initial heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. So this is going all the way along, which is why it's tree bearing, seed bearing trees yeah. and other plants. Look at like the trees are way more stable. Mm -hmm. The grass gets cut like every other week. Mm -hmm. You know, the flowers rise and die. The oak tree remains. So he's pointing out like everything that is said in this thing is some duality of here's the stable thing and here's its corollary that changes. Yeah, which is which I think is, is interesting because in some ways, um, well, this this connects to I mean <laughs> a million different ideas, but it, what it really starts to do is it, it starts to kind of ground some of this symbolic thinking that we've been talking so much about. It starts to bring some of those things down, and it um, cause even the terms that we've been talking about material. We've been talking about material a lot, but we've been talking about it in some of these kind of vaguer terms, right? Like, oh yeah, material is these these physical things around us. But what this really does is it starts to lend like weight and immediacy and importance to like specific material, like things like like dirt and grit. Like those are the things that make things unique and kind of like in the chaos and the um, some of the disorder and like the endless complicatedness of these things that are like around us in our, our everyday life. Like when you think about, 
you know, even trying to like understand uh, like how complicated the weave of this shirt is, you yeah. know, where it's like it's imperfect and it's messy and I could actually never understand this. It's like, well, now we start to see some of the importance of that material because this isn't just a shirt. This is the most specific shirt. Like this is the most, uh, this shirt is unique to itself in every yeah. single way. Right, right. And that gets at like even how we talk about a thing like a shirt. Mm -hmm. Like that shirt is based off of a pattern. Mm -hmm. That's what they're called. Yeah. And that pattern is a design that is like a general idea of what a t-shirt could be. Yeah. And that is held, you know, like literally as like somewhere in some factory. Yeah. There's like this pattern of this is how we cut the, the fabric. Mm -hmm. Every time we're going to make a substantiation, we're referring back to like the heavenly idea and then we're manifesting the physical shirt. And of course, it's done very quickly by machines now. Yeah. But still, everyone, you know, especially, we all know this, like, you know, your pocket is like weird. There's some weird threads there. Yeah. It's different that is different than every other one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, though there is a ton of uniformity, you know, and then let alone when you wear it, it wears in a different way. Yeah. So it's like every single degree of that is like, there's a connection between the heavenly and the earthly. Yeah. Which again gets back to Plato and Aristotle. Because yeah. Plato's all about the heavenly. Yeah. The most important thing is the form. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the most ideal. We're going to seek to try to model the ideals. And Aristotle's like, no, the particularities of the particular manifestation are channeling that ideal in a unique way. Yeah. And it's like right there you can understand the majority of conflicts between philosophical debates. Yeah. What's more important, the idea or the incarnation? No, yeah, and it is. It's a very, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because on some level, it's something that everybody understands. Going back to this, to this shirt in particular, like this shirt exists in a pattern. It exists as the idea of a t-shirt. Yeah. At the same time, it's one of my favorite t-shirts. I wear it like pretty regularly and like I know this t-shirt. Like if yeah. I had to pick this t-shirt out of a lineup of similar t-shirts, I could be like, oh yeah, like I know it's got like, a weird little rip where the tag the tag came off like mm -hmm. that sort of thing that lends it something specific and again bringing it back to kind of the idea of creation and why creation is important like that's what we exist in all the time here it's like yeah. we're not just existing in the idea of a room we're existing in this room and this room is important to us because of the fact that it I think you said it necessarily has substantiation, like it yeah. necessarily is here. Right, I talk about this all the time in basic design, but mm -hmm. I use the terms unity and variety. Yeah. Think about that pattern and inherent manifest or yeah. unique manifestation. And what I like to talk about, at first I start talking about those as opposites on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Unity is, you know, a unite there's a united thing and there's a varietous thing. Yeah. But this is where I love what this book does to expand our understanding of Wendell Berry is that you know when Wendell says that an artwork can remind us of things, one of the ways you can be reminded of something is in how it contrasts. We, we frequently think of like, I saw a candle, it reminded me of a campfire. Why? Because a candle is like a small version of a fire. It's like, well, you could see a candle and you could be reminded of, I don't know, the ocean. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's so different than the ocean. <laughs> yeah. It's like you can see this way in which actually reminders function on this dual level of like everything. So like this room is united to the form of rooms. Mm -hmm. It is an enclosed space that's manufactured by human beings using walls, floors, and ceilings. Yeah. And then it is varietous in the fact that it's like a weird half circle. Mm -hmm. It's got, you know, a certain type of lights instead of, you know, whatever else it's yeah. got. Some, it's got what five windows, like a double door. Yeah. It's like that makes it Varietous. Mm -hmm. Not all rooms have that. Yeah. And it's got a weird closet over there. Who knows what that's for? Monsters, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where it's like, oh, everything is existing if it, inside of this symbolic language of unity and variety. And that when you see that, then you start realizing, like, this is why I actually think it's like, this is, this is where I'm going to sound like a, a religious supremacist. Yeah. This is a better system than the yin and the yang. Hmm. The yin and the yang says a mixture of chaos and order. And what this is saying is chaos and order embedded in each other. Mm -hmm. Of like every single thing of... Uh, so the, the symbol that Peugeot uses is the circle and the square. Yeah. The circle being constant because it's a, the line is a constant distance from the center at all times. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a circle. Yeah. 
and a square being constant but with variety because every single point on the square though it relates to the organization of the square yeah every time you move on the line of a square your distance to the center changes yeah you know and, and obviously the four corners are the same yeah but every other part so it's like you have this pattern substantiation where you're going through constant change in distance from the middle of the square mm -hmm. and that's the like so the heavens are symbolized by circles. Yeah. And the earth is symbolized by a square. No, yeah, like literally even the fact that a, a circle um, is, is so unchanging that it doesn't have a top or a bottom or a left or a right. Like there's yeah. no way to, like orienting yourself on a flat circle or in a circular space is incredibly difficult. Like there's yeah. no way to actually, you told mm. me to, to walk somewhere in a circle and then find that exact same spot again. I doubt I could do it. Or like yeah. if you told me to draw a perfect circle, I, I definitely like it, it takes forever to get anywhere close. Right. But most people can draw a pretty good square on their first try. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a funny way to put it. I hadn't thought about that. There's like, yeah, there's not very many markers inside of a, a circle yeah. for you to understand how do I contextualize this space you usually have to look outside the circle yeah like if you're imagining a circle in a field yeah you're going to be looking at landmarks outside of a blank grass circle mm -hmm. yeah to be like how close was i to that tree over there yeah or, or if you were to expand it into you know i think a lot of his, his illustrations by necessity are, are 2d but sometimes he gives you these weird top views because he shows that he's thinking them as the more as um of 3d but if you were to expand that even further and try and think about like, oh, if you were just to choose a random point in space inside of a sphere, it would be impossible to ever find that point in space again. Like yeah. that's like, that's yeah. a nearly impossible problem. Whereas um, the way we think about coordinates are X, Y, and Z, right? Like we have a really good system for saying, yeah. oh yeah, along these three axes, I plug in my numbers, I know right where I was. Like Right, which is interesting. That actually is another, see, this is, this is one of the things I love about what they're saying. Why? I want to try to agree with them because what you're saying is substantiated in them mm. as in they're saying that the circle is inside the square yeah and think about what that means if you're saying the heavenly pattern is noticed inside of the material particularity mm. yeah and what you just said is well if you find a sphere and you're trying to coordinate somewhere on there you literally need to set up an XYZ cube yeah. grid system that you put the circle inside of mm -hmm. in order to navigate it. Yeah. And it's just like that, like you literally just substantiated their claim. Yeah. Their claim is that there's like this reality of fixedness that in order for us to notice it properly, it has to be manifested physically. Mm -hmm. and it's like, that's a real philosophical sentence. No. But if you deconstruct it and you think, oh, that's why Greg likes this, because that's what art does. Yeah. Art takes ideas that are on this nexus of meaning. Mm -hmm. And then it says, here's, it bodies it forth. Yeah. Here's the physical manifestation of it. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, like it's, it's conforming to the way in which we interact with all of reality. Yeah. It shows you left and right brain interaction. It, it's all of those things, every work of art. Mm -hmm. And obviously some of them are dumb still, <laughs> you know, some of them are bananas duct taped to walls, yeah. but we still get at something where it's like an artwork is pushing against the kind of uh, the 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 mindset that your mind is better or separate from your body mm -hmm. that you should be you know only that you should ignore the body it's like no what the mind experiences is filtered through the body mm -hmm. necessarily yeah you need uniqueness fixedness in order to interact with that like general quality yeah yeah I think that's super um I think that's a super, super important point, especially when you start to kind of dive into these questions of, well, why, why is the material world important? Even, even as an explanation for some of the harder questions, like why are some things like imperfection um, not just important but necessary? Kind yeah. of diving, I think we could talk about this a lot more, but the idea of imperfection and redemption, which is another, another duality, but that in and of itself is kind of this laying out this idea of, circles and squares finding mm -hmm. finding the uniqueness and then making that uniqueness whole again to bring it back towards its uh maybe towards the thing it's pointing at or, or towards its kind of spiritual spiritual fulfillment yeah and this this kind of i think that we've had a really high-minded conversation i want to tie it down to an actual work of art yeah because i think there's 
it's very easy to think about this and be like, well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't change the way I make art yeah. or I view art, um, which is where we're, we're going to go with the next reading as well. We'll get, we'll get away from this, the real heavy symbolism stuff. Yeah. But the reason, the reason I think it's important is to point out um, that uh, art handles this strange reality of life of there's something metaphysical whether you think it's what the bible says or whether you think it's what nietzsche says or mm -hmm. I, I, it doesn't matter <clears throat> yeah. every single world view has to come from the perspective of a human being and it has to say something about what is the universe and what is the metaphysical mm -hmm. even if the statement is the universe is all there is and mm -hmm. there is no god yeah you've still had to define the two realms mm -hmm. And so it's like no matter what, which is why I think there is no God is not a very compelling <laughs> answer. Um, you're still saying the, the realm of God exists, but it's empty. Yeah. Really? I mean, yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's hard to rectify. It's a really interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But, um, but so what art <clears throat> is, it necessarily merges those two things. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you, um, I'm going to switch the tab yeah. here. This is David Wallace Haskins. Um, I forget the, does he have, this doesn't have the exact title of it. Let me see if I can find the exact title here. Um, there it is, Image Continuous. Yeah. So it's made up of a cube, and this will, for, for folks to see it, we'll, we'll have it edited in here between us, but it's a cube of mirrors set in a forest, and obviously, like, it's a relatively easy trick inside of this cube of mirrors. One of the mirrors has a circle cut out. Yep. And then there's a mirror placed at a 45 degree angle inside, yeah. the, inside the cube. Yeah. But the visual experience, so it's like, I just told you the idea, mm -hmm. the, the pattern. Yeah. But that doesn't actually give you very much. No, it doesn't. Like, yeah. I mean, what, are, what else are you seeing? Like I told you what it materially was, but what did that leave out? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of, I mean, really, interesting things happening here and I actually think the the first image we were looking at which is the one we'll probably use did it a little bit better because um, in yeah in, in this image there's like a brief second where you really can't tell what you're looking at yeah. and and what it does so well is it um, it makes it look like there's just a circle of open sky just floating in the middle of the woods. Like yeah. that's that's what it does. Yeah. Is it, the mirror really blends? The photographer's not included in the image somehow. They've they've done a great job of lining up the um, lining up the reflection with the background. So so what you're really looking at is a, essentially a distortion, and then the sky is just here on eye level with me in the woods. Yep. And which is like a like i i can't wait to go see this we should go see this sometime together it's in illinois oh yeah um there's such uh so again if we just take the symbolism that the pajos set up here mm -hmm. heavenly circular yeah earth square yeah immediately you can see some comp some like that that's what this is yeah the heavenly realm is produced as a circle mm -hmm. and it's a inside of a square the the air is seen in the land mm -hmm. and it's really weird because the other thing i love about this this is where um, much of what the pajos do is very uh like again they're trying to revive kind of a med medieval kind of mindset and and uh the point where i would disagree is like i actually think there are some very valuable things from modernism and postmodernism. Mm -hmm. one of them being representation isn't all that it seems to be hmm. in fact in representation you're still uh you're pointing to the system they set up yeah rather than engaging in it actually this isn't representation no it's literal that is a presentation of a reflection of actual creation or actual forest and actual sky mm -hmm. which means it's showing us in a non-representative manner their symbolic system a circle of heaven inside of a square of earth. Which is, which is really, I mean, the, even, even so seeing it here on the computer screen, what we're looking at is a representation and it's still right, incredibly right. effective. Like it really yeah. is, but I'm, I'm, I'm picturing what it would be like to actually be with this and imagining like what it would be like for my perception of space to be this kind of thrown off by something. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine it would be a really 
pretty disorienting and probably powerful experience to like be like, oh, like that's, I'm, I'm looking into the woods and I'm seeing heaven or I'm looking into the woods and I'm seeing sky. Isn't right. it? And I'm not looking at a, what somebody told me the sky looks like or I'm not looking at what this artist describes the sky. I'm looking actually at the sky. Right. Which actually enables you to see the sky. Yeah. You know, like we think about, we've talked a bit about how like so much of our perceptions is ignoring things. Mm -hmm. It's trying to make sense of what is relevant. And what this piece does is it literally grounds the sky. And because it did that, we can now actually see it. Mm -hmm. Like you don't look at the sky, like very few people do. And you don't look at this focused of a part of it. Yeah. You know, we literally had to create a scientific process in order to train people to start looking at things objectively. And even then, how do the scientists know which stars to look at? Yeah. You know, like they can choose any of them and yeah. somehow they're making these decisions. The whole entire thing is like the framing mechanism of the square actually reveals to you the thing that's there and you just weren't looking at. Yeah. And it's like that, like, Again, to think about what is the what is the use of something like symbolic understanding to to further your ability to be reminded of things. Mm -hmm. It's like this system of thinking about there's there's like a uniting force that is like an idea or like a, a platonic forms realm. Yeah, and there's a varietous substantiation that allows you access to it. Suddenly changes like oh that's what art is doing. And you might find, well, the art that I like is highly, you know, obviously, I like work that is not representational. Yeah. It's highly conceptual. Yep. And it helps me get at these weird philosophical ideas that I don't understand and I wrestle with. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, like, this is, I love this piece. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, I, I think about this daily, <laughs> along with the Roman Empire. Yep. Uh, and I, and it's like, it's so unique. Other people that might not, they might not have the same experiences as I. Mm -hmm. And they have different tastes into like what is the thing that gets them to a really interesting place where they're both reasoning and experiencing something interesting and that uh, ultimately expands their horizon of life. Mm -hmm. And that's where like I, I'm this, this notion that comes from Wendell Berry of a nexus of reminders and Wyke brought with redeeming vision and like creating your archives of, of memory really yeah. And also, like, I would accent that with something like this of, like, not only memory and memory of culture, but then also your ability to parse how it relates to the structure of how the universe unfolds in front of you. Yeah. Things are, a, everything you interact with is some form of a connection to a metaphysical idea and some form of a unique manifestation of that thing. Yeah. I think, I think to maybe, to ground this piece a little bit more, what I might say Part of what makes it so so interesting to me is that it um, it would be pretty difficult for me to place it on that map that we've been talking about, where mm -hmm. it doesn't immediately call to mind a lot of similar imagery. It mm -hmm. doesn't immediately call to mind a lot of um, movie or literature references. Like there isn't like like if I thought about it for a while, I'm sure I could find connections, but that's not my immediate. Um, that's not my immediate experience. But at the same time, it, it feels like it definitely holds a place on that map. Like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like a very clear spot. So right. what's, what's so interesting is that it's in some ways it's, it's almost like pointing out, oh, there's a, there's a different spot on this map that you can be a little bit, even it's, it's connected and removed at the same time. It isn't literature, it isn't art. It isn't uh, sculpture, maybe in the same way that we would think about these things. Yeah. But this idea is still connecting to a lot of other yeah. things. You can think of it like this, uh, like what I'm trying to get at. It's, that's exactly right, is that um, when you encounter something confusing and unknown, mm -hmm. how do you manage to connect it to your tree? Yeah. It's going to be through a methodology or through a language, as in a language sets up a system of categorizing and naming. Mm -hmm. Every single language does that. Yeah. And think about what that is doing. It's saying, what category does this fit into? What general overarching idea is it? Yeah. And then how is it different? Mm -hmm. And that's the specific name. This is what I mean by like, 
what the symbolic language reveals is the nature of reality as some form of attention between unity and variety, between pattern and individual. Yeah. And what that does is when you start doing that, then you start realizing like, no, the circle and the square is not that, like it's so general. First of all, it's like, okay, like a weird business logo maybe. Yeah. Um, like if you were just looking for uh, uh, exact shape repetition, mm -hmm. where do you see squares? Where do you see circles? Yeah. Then you might start making some other connotations. Well, where do you see circles that have the sky in them? It's like, well, Oculus is thinking of the Pantheon in mm -hmm. Rome. You know, maybe that's also connected to halos because yeah. they're like heavenly space in a circle format. Uh -huh. um, there's actually a lot of connection to halos. Like, but you see, like you can start making these connections in that manner. But then you can also do this thing of like, well, how does it fit into the structure? It's like it shows stability inside of like the changing world. Yeah. And the blue sky is extremely stable. Mm -hmm. The thing below that, the clouds, is less stable. Yep. And then if you're looking, as, especially if it's a windy day, all of those reflections are gonna be changing like crazy. Yeah. And it's like you're seeing that nature of how is it connected and how is it varietous in the different levels. And so what I think about is, it's a perfect manifestation of what I said earlier of Plato's finger pointing up and Aristotle's hand down and the fact that they're on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think like if I if I had to describe if I had to describe this viewing experience of even just this this image to somebody like like oh what did the piece look like what I would say is like oh it looks like a like a hole got punched out of reality like it looks right. like somebody cut a hole in like in the physical space around me and is letting me see through or see past something yeah and that's like that's a fairly remarkable experience that's what we a lot of art does but maybe not and so. Um, this this does it in uh, I mean in almost a, an incredibly literal way where literally that's a whole kind of cut out of reality yeah, but like yeah. that's that's what I'm looking at is I'm seeing I'm seeing through and right that's that's a really important experience and the, what's really funny is I've seen videos of people interacting with a lot of his pieces and they're enchanted by them mm -hmm. there's something very halting about it where it's so bizarre mm -hmm. and yet so familiar. We all know what the sky looks like, yeah. but then we're seeing it in a context that is so strange, and yet they all seem to have a very comforting response, and people are so curious, and they walk up to it, and they look into it, mm -hmm. and it's just like, it's a, it's all together like, it's that one plus one equals three thing. Yeah. Of like, if you just describe what it is made of, you're not getting at it at all. Yeah. And if you just describe the system, circles and squares, you're also not getting at it. Mm -hmm. It's like this is this weird bringing together that, again, is I'm, I'm using it in the sense of like having you read it in order to understand that it's like the more you dive into how human beings experience the world, mm -hmm. the more you can start to make interesting observations about what things mean. So like yeah. the other day, a student was working with tea and I was like, oh, isn't it interesting to think about what tea is? Dead, like living tree mm -hmm. dies, like the, you, you pluck the leaves, you dry them out so they're dead. Yep. They're effectively dead leaves. Yeah. You reinvigorate them in warm water usually. It mm -hmm. doesn't actually have to be warm, but yeah. in water. It's like you think of dead, uh, immobilized like dry bones mm -hmm. and then you think about water changing moving life yeah. constantly at move at, in moving and then on top of that boil it you really you enliven the water mm -hmm. you make it really in, and you steep the leaves in there and they are reinvigorated in such a manner that they disperse their life into the water mm -hmm. and then you drink that water and you get invigorated by the dead leaves yeah it's like they're and they were like, "How? Where'd you read that?" Yeah. Like, I didn't read it. I I understood this, yeah. which gave me a mindset to understand. Oh, isn't it really weird that we are drinking dead leaves? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. And it's like you're able to use that system to start. Then you know, it, every time I see tea, is it going to necessarily mean just that? No. No. You yeah. know, sometimes people are going to splash tea in your face. <laughs> yeah. And it's like. But what it does is, especially in the context of art, it gives you more ways to start thinking about how do I lasso this thing in to my 
series of reminders? Yeah. How do I broaden my mind so that I can understand art more? Yeah. I think um, going going back to this piece, because I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with it. This is my first time seeing yeah, it. But, yeah. but one of the things that's so interesting about it is that um, similar, uh, well, well, I'll say this. Everything about this piece was here originally. Yeah. You could have stood in this spot and looked at the earth and then looked up at the heaven and then looked up at the earth right. and looked up at the heaven. Like you could have done that. The sky probably looked pretty similar to that two days before it was installed and the woods probably looked very similar to that a couple days before it was installed. Like it was yeah. all there. Right. And and all of a sudden through the process of art making, like it's been recontextualized and reframed to say something important. Yeah. And suddenly then you see it. Suddenly then you see it. That's like the art is the incarnation of the idea. Yeah. It's the bringing together of this so that suddenly, like once you've seen this, at least for a while, as long as it's in your memory, you'll even look at the sky around us all the time differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll realize, oh my God, it's here. Yeah. Like I, I always think about like whenever, whenever I revisit this piece, I just think about how as long as I'm not underwater, I'm walking in the sky. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. that's a weird thing to, you know, it sounds so poetic and like, oh, uh, does that really affect your everyday life? No, but when I think about it that way, it changes yeah. the way I act. Mm -hmm. When I think I'm walking in the sky, I'm not being as much of a jerk and as selfish. <laughs> like literally, yeah. I'm walking in the sky. Yeah. You know, like I'm not, you know, getting to class. Yeah. It's a, and it's the same thing with the tea where again, it can be viewed as this really like mundane experience. But then you think about, um, there, are, there are lots of cultures that have tea ceremonies that mm -hmm. really put so much importance on every step of that process and make it into a ritual. And um, there's, there's, I mean, interestingly enough, there's countless performance art pieces that have to do with tea making as a ritual. Like yeah. that's a really common uh, trope. But um, And this, this system helps explain why that was even developed by human beings. Yeah. You know, why wasn't it something else? Yeah. You know, why was it that this guy named Jesus comes and he says winemaking? Mm -hmm. He has a whole section on winemaking, which is super interesting. Yeah. But it is very similar to tea, except there's like an added step in that it, well, if you can think of it like this. You take the blood of the fruit of the vine, mm -hmm. you smash it so it bleeds. Yeah. You then put it in a casket, we call it a cask, mm -hmm. and you put the, you bury that in the ground. Yeah. And then after some time, after it's been dead for long enough, when you bring it out, we call it inspirited. Yeah. It's a spirit. Yeah. It's like, oh, if you provide, if you, if you allow things to die and you plant them in the earth, they might grow into something better. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's plants. That's a, like all of it gets back to being an embodied human being of like, is it a scientific explanation as to why? No, yeast is. Yeast and fermentation, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is like a, you, you can start to see how human beings are deriving meaning through our experience of our body and our mind. And like those things coming together are where we start to drive meaning and how we, you know, ha like all of the words we say around things um, are just, you know, so obviously related to the fact that we're like human beings, yeah. you know, and, and um, I, idioms do it all the time of like, um, you know, Norm MacDonald has this whole joke about a hatchery and whatnot and how, you know, telling the story of like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Why? Because if they're all in one basket and you drop the basket, they're all broken. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. an embodied experience. Yeah. The, the statement is a statement of the manifestation is like the overarching idea yeah. that is ruler over all of the small manifestations of every basket full of eggs. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, like this is how humans function. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, and then you can think of like Ian McGilchrist going into thinking through like, why do we function that way? How did that evolve? Why do we have two hemispheres of our brain and how does that make us successful and, and unique and all these different yeah. things? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's probably a pretty good place to stop for this week. I think so, yeah. I think next week I want you to read some Walker Percy because if, if we as artists are thinking about how do we, um, you know, how do we get meaning? How do we, like all of these nuanced ways in which things are connected to that trunk or that mm -hmm. network, Yeah. Um, 
the question is then for uh, yourself and myself as practicing artists, how do we make that evident to our audience? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to be Walker, Walker Percy for. Awesome. Sounds good. Excellent.